This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Tom Keen, along with Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, geopolitics, finance, and investment. Subscribe to Bloomberg Surveillance On Demand on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you get your podcasts. And always on Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. Joining us with 22V Research, 22V Research is Michael Herson, head of their China research this morning. Michael, were you surprised by the NBC report of a discussion between the two world leaders over the future of Taiwan? No, not particularly surprised. It was consistent with what I heard from the meeting. I obviously wasn't there, uh, so I can't speak to the details. But I think the notion that Xi Jinping is determined to pursue reunification with Taiwan is not new. I think in some ways it was equally as interesting that he told U.S. officials, according to this report, that there is no set timeline for China to do so. And I think that is consistent with the view that while this is a really important issue, um, Beijing continues to exercise what you could call strategic patience on this issue. And that's important because if that changes, it does, I think, you know, increase the near-term risks around Taiwan. For now, I think those near-term risks are manageable. There is this question around whether China is going to take an opportunity at a time where the U.S. is involved in a two-front proxy war with both Russia and Iran to try to engage in this more aggressively, since it's already difficult for the U.S. to commit exactly how much they're going to weigh in on these other conflicts. I don't think we should dismiss those kinds of concerns. I mean, we need to be realistic about, you know, not mirror imaging in terms of how China thinks that they're going to think about this the same way that we do. At the same time, I think we need to keep in mind there's a fundamental calculus at work for Beijing, which is right now it would be extremely risky, even with the U.S. tied down, so to speak, with other conflicts to pursue reunification through military uh, means. And I don't think that the urgency is there for China. I think Beijing continues to feel that time is on their side. Now, that timeline is not um, infinite, as I, according to the report Xi Jinping stressed to President Biden. But I think the notion that Beijing would take this kind of gamble in the near term seems to me probably not worth it from the standpoint of China's leadership. What is the motivation to try to uh, take Taiwan at a time where there's some real clouds over the economic outlook for China, where they're trying to woo back U.S. Uh, and other international businesses, and where Xi Jinping is dealing with a host of issues around the housing market that are also challenging? I think that's exactly right. I think if they made this kind of move now, it would basically be trading off all of Xi Jinping's broader ambitions for China in terms of economic development um, and its place in global leadership. So I don't think that the calculus is worth it for Beijing. I think the risk is that this could change over time. Beijing could decide that it's less risky and more urgent for them as time goes on. But I don't think that that calculus is going to shift such as to argue right. for a, an armed conflict over Taiwan anytime soon. We should add, though, we have a very important election coming up in Taiwan, January 13th, a presidential right. election, which is going to have an important bearing on these issues. This is right where I wanted to go. Mike Orson, one final question. We've got to march on here with our day, and thank you so much for joining. But abruptly here, our stereotype is the KMT and the Pan Blue Coalition. They lost in 2016. The domestic politics of Taiwan, are they uniformly for America and for independence, or is there a nuance there that Beijing can play off of? There's a nuance. I do think fundamentally voters in Taiwan want to maintain the status quo. And the difference between the two camps really is what is the best way to maintain that status quo? Keeping China at an arm's length or engaging with China in a more close uh, you know, political economic relationship? A terrific brief. Michael Herson, thank you so much. Thrilled that he could join us. Super excited that Francis Donald's with us in the studio, Global Chief yeah. Economist, st Strategist, Emmanuel Life. Morning, Francis. Good morning. Your take on all that beautiful Fed speak of the last week. 
Any uh, clearer? I think it's all semantics. We are in a Thank global you. easing cycle. They can tell us they're not talking about it, but then we're talking about how they're not talking about it. Emerging markets are cutting. Every single day I get a new emerging market that's cutting. They led the cycle on the way up in rates. They are leading on the way down. Every morning I wake up to inflation prints that are surprising to the downside. Macro is most valuable at inflection points. The toothpaste is out of the tube. We have already effectively eased. We will see it very soon in some areas like housing that has very strong reactivity. It doesn't change that I still technically have two quarters of negative GDP in my forecast, so that's technically a recession. But if we do get this earlier easing via financial markets, it will help us come out faster and it will reduce the odds um, of financial accidents, which has been a concern for some economists on this. With Apple, it's 30 times forward earnings right now. Excuse me, on present earnings, 32 times PE multiple. They need to make earnings. They need to make revenues, which means they need to live within decent nominal GDP. Are we going to see enough oomph nominal GDP to keep the earnings and revenue boat going? I don't know where it's going to come from, Tom. It's not coming from CapEx, which is declining sharply. There's not a lot of fiscal room. We talk about the U.S. soft landing, hard landing. That's only a U.S. conversation because anywhere else I go in the world, we're not discussing soft landing or hard landing because we're already in hard landing. Germany is most probably in a recession. A whole range of DMs are already in recession. Uh, Asia is slowing very prominently. So we don't have the global impulse that comes through. And the consumer is declining and slow. We don't need the consumer to be in a recession for the U.S. economy to be in a recession. So two things can be true at the same time. We can be celebrating the pivot party, which we are, and recognize that it's not going to be a straight line up for equities and a straight line down for bonds. In fact, I, I might ask of you actually at this table is every time you have a guest come on, ask them what their investment horizon is because your investment horizon for the next three months is very different than your nine month to 12 month horizon. And you have to be able to reconcile the two when, when they are different perspectives. And in this environment, they are different perspectives. We already know. It's what happened yesterday. Extrapolate that out. Five minutes and see if it changes. Isn't that it, Bramo? <laughs> the last two months? I mean, this is the reason why people are saying we're bullish. There might be some volatility, but buy it. And so at what point is this just basically being bullish into next year and trying to have a unique take on it? Here's my question to you. Is there a risk of us not getting a landing? If you have a longer term horizon, does it have to include a greater risk of reinflation? You know, if you have a five to 10 year horizon, which a lot of sticky institutional money does, they are not asking me, do you have a recession call? They want to know what the five to 10 year inflation outlook is. They want to know where interest rates are going to be. They want to know, are central banks going to be changing inflation targets? Because if so, then our relationship between inflation and interest rate changes, and that changes our long-term asset allocation models. So no, there are certain investors who do not care about recession risk for 2024. And that's important. They are asking large more important questions about the framework with, when our with which our financial markets change. And that's why I think the Powell pivot is so critical and interesting to this large sticky money, because it basically said this concept of, you know what, we need 2% inflation in order to cut. We need to see the evidence. We're focused on services, X rents, all of this discussion around financial conditions. Now, I've heard you over the past few days question, what was it that led to the pivot? That question to me is far more important than how many rate cuts do we have next year or is it one quarter or two quarters of negative GDP? So let's go to the labour market and talk about some of the forces underpinning maybe this pivot. There's a belief on the street from a lot of people, I think led by Neil Data earlier on this year, that this labour market is no longer a reason to be hawkish. What America has benefited from is this supply side led rebalancing in the labour market, increased participation. Do you see reason to believe that continues into next year? Is that something we're taking for granted? Yeah, any sort of leading indicator you have of the job market right now is going to tell you that things are deteriorating and going in the wrong direction. Now, markets are second derivative creatures. They're going to care more about the rise in the unemployment rate than how far it necessarily goes up until a breaking point. So the unemployment rate is going to rise. It takes two years for the first Fed rate hike to impact the labor market. That's Q1. The mistake in calling for that to happen last year was thinking that that lag would be shorter because the Fed moved faster. 
But until we get through the next three to six months, we won't be able to say that the relationship between rates and the labor market is truly broken because we haven't even passed the first starting post of when that's going right. to impact things. So I can't throw out the argument that the labor market interest rate uh, conversation is totally different than it has been in the past because we're not even there yet. So what do you watch to see if wage disinflation begins? Well, real-time data, probably. We need surveys. We need to be keeping a close eye on that. But maybe, Tom, we also need to be asking how much is it going to matter to the inflation story. We went from 9% down to 3% and change on inflation, largely off of the disinflation from supply chain dynamics. Are we allowed to say that that was transitory yet? Like, is my head going to be on a stick for that Would you like to? I'll just float it. I'm going to throw up the balloon and see what kind of pushback I get on Twitter. Uh, The next phase is when we're going to... Think, yeah. by the, way. Uh, the next phase of disinflation is what they call the painful part, not because it's hard to go from 3% to 2%, but because consumers and wages carry the brunt of that. So we would posit that the disinflation we've seen so far, we don't get to actually say thank you, Fed, for that. It's the next part that comes. And so what I want to know is this wage inflation story, how critical is it to actually the inflation that we're monitoring? And what inflation does the Fed need to see? Is it just a headline number or core number around two? Or does it matter where it's coming from? Because my sense is we got told a lot in the past year. It mattered where it was coming from. I think it just matters that we're closer to target. I'm so pleased that you brought some of these issues up because I think they're so important. Lisa, just how much of the disinflation that we've seen so far is actually off the back of the Federal Reserve tightening of the last 18 months? Speak to people like Francis, the answer is not much of it. When you talk to a lot of economists, they've been using the T word all along. They just are being a little bit louder about it and basically saying maybe the Fed was right and it was transitory. And that's the reason why the Fed's getting nervous, because if the Fed's uh, actual rate hikes start to kick in, then it starts to become something else in a downward cycle. That said, the jury's still out and service sector inflation is still going up. So this is a huge question mark, not to mention we still have supply chain issues. Recycling the T word, shameless. Just shameless. Yeah, are you talking to me? Francis Donald, (laughs) head on a stake. (laughs) Francis, thank you. You're one of the best. Appreciate it. The inflation-adjusted yield, which is what I look at and our next guest looks at, is 1.69%. It was a 2, and there was sweat on effect higher to 2.20 or even unimaginably high in this melt-up. The inflation-adjusted yield, one measurement of our good feeling, has really come down. Jim Karen is expert at this, CIO of Portfolio Solutions Group at Morgan Stanley. You take the Christmas field, Jim, you talk about naughty or nice in the real yield. What is a level of the real yield that keeps asset inflation going? So I, I think where the Fed wants to go with this, because what really matters is what they think. And I'm, I'm, and I'm going to talk about the policy, the real policy yield. So this is a nominal Fed funds rate minus inflation. I think that number is around one and a half percent. So it's lower than what it is today. Wow. So if we look at nominal, if we look at nominal Fed funds today at five and a half percent, and let's say U.S. inflation is at three, that means real policy rates are at two and a half percent which means that the Fed could cut 100 basis points just to get to their neutral level. So I know we've been talking, I've I've listened on the show, that yes, there's like six rate cuts priced in, but remember 100 basis points of those rate cuts is really just getting to neutral. Right. And they don't start really easing until they start doing more than 100. I did some fancy math, Jim, in honor of your attending today on the standard deviation move of the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index. We've gone from accommodative, and this is not Stan Fisher 101, it's Tom Keen 101, we're grossly accommodative. How does the Fed, their degrees of freedom just seem to have shrunk because of the market's statement on accommodation. Right. So when we look at financial conditions, this is really a way for the Fed to gauge how their monetary policy is is impacting the broader markets. And there should be some feedback mechanism from markets to what their policy is actually saying. So the way that the way that I think about this is that if the markets are rallying, that's okay with the Fed. The Fed doesn't have to push back on on a rally because they don't like a rally. That's not their job. Effectively, what they're saying is, can we get this rally and can inflation also stay low? And if the answer is yes to both, 
then they don't care if, if the market continues to rally. They don't feel as though they have to push back on that. And right now, the look through to inflation going forward, as you mentioned in, in the UK, we had a downside surprise in inflation. Inflation is coming down in the US. As long as it does, then the Fed is OK with higher equity prices, tighter credit spreads, and even easier financial conditions, as long as we don't get inflation starting to move higher. Which is, uh, let's park that for a second, this idea that disinflation, Goldilocks, this idea of the Fed just simply cutting rates surgically in order to keep in tandem with where inflation is going and go to actually the fundamental economy and earnings. And I wonder how much that is the real risk that people are not talking about right now, given the fact that FedEx disappointed shares lower by some 12 percent in early in pre-market trading, General Mills retracting some of their full year forecast, downgrading it in response to a uh, lower sales, those shares falling even after an underwhelming, underwhelming performance. Is this the theme of January that people are missing? So, so that's a really good question, Lisa, because effectively we have to, we have to think about the look through to this. If the unemployment rate starts to rise, because that's what we're talking about. When we're talking about earnings and missing earnings and things like this, what we're really saying, what an economist is really saying, is at what point do these companies start laying workers off and at what point does that boost the unemployment rate? So what we're seeing at this point, at least the last data point in the un in unemployment rate, the unemployment rate has come down. The labor market still remains relatively tight and, and it's relatively strong. Yes, it's softening. Yes, we are seeing signs of softening, but we're not seeing signs of a collapse. So ultimately, some of these things are, are, are going to be somewhat cyclical. Some companies are going to post worse earnings. Some companies are going to post better earnings. But if we look at the broad market, the story for December is actually not that these supercharged seven stocks are doing really well in tech. The story for December is that the market's actually broadening out, is that the is that the other sectors, the other 493 stocks out of you know the, the, the S&P 500, excluding those seven, are actually participating in the upside. So yes, it's not going to be a straight line. It's going to be volatile. But the point here is that missing earnings is one thing, and that could be cyclical, and, and, and I get that sector by sector. But as long as it doesn't affect hiring and, and, and wages and, and things like that, to the degree that it creates a deeper downturn and loss of consumption, then that's just markets being markets. It sounds like you're pretty bullish. Are you just telling clients to go all in that basically their biggest risk is missing out on the upside next year? No, I'm not saying that. Actually, you know, one of the things that we, you know, we, we've been bullish, we've been positive, we've been overweight in equities all year. Um, and right now, towards the end of this year, we're starting to think about reducing that and moving towards neutral. We haven't done it yet, but, but, that's, but that's probably our next step. And why that is, is because everything that we thought about in late October, November, is actually already come through. By, by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So we've got this like 15% rally across the board in equities. We've got credit spreads a lot tighter. Bond yields, 10-year yields are below 4%. My, my gosh, my year-end forecast for the 10-year note, not that I make a forecast, but was around 4% and we're already, we're already right. there. Right. So I think a lot of that good news has been pulled forward. So we need another catalyst right. to get higher. And I'm, I'd rather go to neutral, and I think neutral is the new defensive, so we can be tactical in right. the new year ahead because there will be dislocations. Jim, a cosmic question for those trying to recover from the bond debacle. You, you was negative 10 degrees at Bowdoin. You were studying physics. You go, oh, Caltech, that may be warm. So you go out to Caltech to get some decent weather in aeronautical engineering. Okay, great. Are these glide paths, glide paths of stability, and do they indicate that dividend growth is a proxy for yield forward? That, that back and forth between your world of bonds and equities is a yield alternative. Can that be possible? So... I, I think it can be possible. I, I don't see it as highly probable. And the thing that I'm concerned about the most is that I do think that 2024 will be a, a very rocky year. So I know we're talking about these glide paths and soft landings. Um, we may ultimately get uh, a mild slowdown or a mild recession, which would be char characterized as a soft landing. But I think it's I think it's a really dangerous landing at, at this point, um, and it's one of the reasons why I think that we need to engage in more of a balanced portfolio approach. So have some fixed income, have some equity, have some growth, have some value. And just real quick, Jim, right. before uh, yeah. we run out of time, what do you mean by dangerous landing? 
So I think there's more geopolitical tensions and more geopolitical risks that are out there to start this year than last year. We have obviously, you know, China, Taiwan, we have Taiwan elections, we have a U.S. presidential election. I think that's going to create a lot of volatility. And I think the markets are, and don't forget, we have the 2025, you know, the Trump tax cuts come, come due in 2025. At some point in 2024, we're going to start to price the outcome of that in. And that can swing the markets from an earnings perspective yeah. quite a bit and from a multiple perspective. So I think let's just enjoy this calm right now because I think it's going to get a lot rockier and a lot less, un, you know, a lot more uncertain into the future. Jim Karen, thank you. With Morgan Stanley there on your total return and ability to clip a coupon. With a growing iPhone business into next year on the heels of what we view as a new tech bull market beginning, Apple is poised to have a strong year ahead, TK. Interesting. And of course, he's been all over the media, but also he's been right, right, right. As I mentioned, Neil Dutt is maybe my economist of the year on the sell side, getting a magnificent seven right. Nobody's been as visible and articulate is Mr. Ives. He holds court at Wedbush. I want to go to the morning's valuation where you give me a half-assed sum of the parts. You've got the service sector out to $1.5 trillion of $4 trillion, which is $257 per share. What's the total sum of the parts? Is it above 257, 12 months out? Yeah, it's closer to 300, some of the parts. And you just can't go to $5 trillion because you don't want to you know, be inflammatory. Well, well, the big thing is really the services is going to be the key over the next year. The re-rating that we're going to see in Apple, I think numbers moving higher, is going to be services driven. I think that's where the 1.5 to 1.6 right. trillion comes in. But I do think what's <clears throat> starting to happen now, you know, despite what John, in terms of like some of the China issues, you're now seeing unit growth come up. ASP is going up. To me right, right now, in Cupertino, they're popping the champagne, getting ready for a phenomenal year ahead. Buried in the CFA is a, is a, is a barbell. And one is, are you running as a revenue growth story or are you running as a profit-making story? To me, Apple's almost out of Graham, Dodd, and Cottle. They're running this thing for profit, right? And that's how, that's how Cook, it's what Jobs did, it's how they've done it. And I, but I think the difference, to, to your point, it's the monetization. The install base is unparalleled. Two billion iOS devices. So now half of them are in my house. Continue. Exactly. And look, and you're one of the cross-selling opportunities for Cook. And, <laughs> and, and the thing is, is that now what, what what's starting to happen is that if you look at the services piece and you look at the penetration, the average Apple customer is still 20 to 25 percent penetrated from a services perspective. That's going to continue to up. And then I believe the big thing here is the AI app store that I think they introduced over the next year. That's going to be the new shiny object. Okay, before we get to the new shiny object, let's talk about the old shiny object, the iPhone. If I told you where revenue was and where it would be at the start of the year for the end of the year, would you have said the stock was up 52% year to date? Yeah, so, okay, so what I'd say is that part has definitely been an upside surprise in terms of where the stock, I think the difference it really it rests on the services business and what I believe is the margin story. So even though in, from a unit perspective, there have been some choppiness over the last quarter or two, if you look at the mar margins are up. I mean, so they've been able to expand gross margins in this environment, which I know we've talked about a lot of this on the show, but that just shows that they have control over their ecosystem from a chip perspective. That's been a key of the bull. You think they can go X growth but still retain a growth multiple? I think they, this past year, they were able to go X growth and get the growth multiple. This next year, the renaissance of growth happens in Cupertino <clears throat> on services back double digits. Unit from an iPhone unit perspective go, continues to, to, I'll say, single digits. And the China story, despite all the worries, despite many yelling fire in a crowded theater, we, we're going to see China growth. It's not exactly fire in a crowded theater when everyone keeps piling in. But I am wondering if uh, you see growth coming mostly from the United States or if that's international growth. Where does it come from in a pretty competitive landscape? I think 70 percent of it's U.S. and Europe. 30% of the growth, the incremental growth is in China. Because Lisa, if you look at today, 100 million iPhones in China have not been upgraded in three years. So even with Huawei and what, even in Huawei and what we're seeing, the, the actual penetration, the upgrade opportunity, I'll call it essentially a mini super cycle that's playing. And look, as of 24 hours ago, our Asia checks showing no cuts 
And I think that's very important. You know why I'm holidays. laughing? Because you said exactly the same thing 12 months ago, and it didn't happen. Where is this upgrade super cycle? Okay, so now to that point, the upgrade cycle has under the radar been happening. But I mean, at some point, don't you sit there and say that these phones haven't been upgraded for a reason, and then maybe they're not going to be upgraded. But they w and look, and I know it's a great point that you've brought up from an upgrade cycle. I think the difference is, is that the last 18 months, maybe the upgrades have been at a slower pace, but they've gained 100 million new iPhones in the last 18 months. So I think if maybe we've been right for the wrong reasons, whatever you want to call it, it's like the upgrade opportunity we admit has definitely been a little more subdued this year than we would have expected. But on the upside, what we didn't expect is that the, the Android market share gains that they've gotten have been a flex the muscles moment. There's no doubt you've been right. I just want to get into the reasoning sure. about it. You know that, but you have been right. The stock is up by 52% year to date. I can't argue with that. Can we talk about the watch just briefly? Yeah. Telling Father Christmas he can't deliver presents on December 26th is not a big deal. I just wonder, the gift from the regulator, from your point of view, to turn around to Apple and say, can't sell the iWatch from December 25th. I mean, what does that actually do? What does that achieve? When the red phone rings and it's Cook and Cupertino, that's... You look, think that made a difference? Look, the fact this was Apple, you think that's actually made a difference to the regulator? When I think Apple just brings the different price, and we see it in terms of big tech, and it's one where the e, e, within Europe, and what we see continue to come out of Brussels, and even in the US, there's a recognition where you, you don't want to poke the bear. Like, in other words, like to actually do this in a holiday season, to go, let's say, December 15th, would have been much more drastic than obviously going Christmas Eve. But this is, look, this is not ending. They're going to continue to have patent issues and battles on the health care front. Are they really a proletariat issue, though, when they're charging $1,400 for an iPhone? I mean, is this a sort of going to become an issue if margins are too big and they do get the nods from the regulators <clears throat> at a time of souring economic backdrop? Does that become a real pressure point of just how much those margins can keep expanding? Look, I think margins continue to expand because from a chip perspective, they own their own ecosystem. I and mean, that's really been the, that's, the, and Keen's talking about, that's a huge part of the opportunity in terms of just gaining more and more margins. But from a regulator perspective, I mean, look, look, I'm more focused on the cappuccino this morning than regulators in Europe <laughs> because that continues to just be noise, not real. You sound like a man who's got stocks up 50% this year, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> okay, Let's be clear. And for radio, you're not getting the full joy of this because Dan Ives is dressed like a pinata this morning. You are the bear market <laughs> pinata uh, that's out there. They love going after you. And to me, the heart of the matter, and I'm going to go back to Graham Dodd and Coddle, EBITDA 2019, 29% margin. EBITDA right now, 33% margin. Where's that EBITDA margin in four years? That's getting toward 40%, and I think really? that- Really, you're look, gonna give me an EBITDA of 40%? I, I believe because as services becomes a bigger piece, the margins on that's double the hardware business. So as they further mod, if you're a bull right now, you're not looking at the next year, you're looking at the next two, three years, it's a cash flow machine, EBITDA is going to continue to expand. margin on EBITDA? When you look toward 2025, 2026, you, this is one where it's going to continue to <clears> move <throat> in that direction. Okay, you've got 30 seconds. You're going to tell me now, what on earth is an AI app store? What is that? There's going to be a separate app store okay. in Apple that's going to be health, it's going to be health, fitness, AI apps developers are going to build that Apple will have, it's going to be an offshoot of the App Store, an AI app store. And right now, it's all about developers. That's the hearts and lungs of Cupertino. Right. The hearts and lungs here is radio's not taking all this in. You got the day glow pink sneakers, the lime green, lime sorbet pants. You got the lavender thing going up top. He looks like a pinata. You should punch back. He was wearing leopard print Doc Martens the other day. Well, that's okay. But I respected okay. Doc Martens. <laughs> <laughs> leopard print. Love it. It's aggressive, but he could pull it off. It's yeah. aggressive. <laughs> it's aggressive. Dan Ives, congratulations, no. sir. Fabulous Thanks for year. Home been bullish. You were right to be. Thanks for Thank being you. with us. Dan Ives of Wedbush. One of the great doers in our international relations is Aaron David Miller. His thesis was Search for Security, centering on Saudi Arabia. He's senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Aaron, you have written about the stretch of sea 
which to us is romantic, indeed biblical, the Red Sea. What is distinctive about the Red Sea in Yemen? Uh, it's turned into a choke point, frankly. Uh, and you, know, you 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 referred to the the to the region centrality in both the fifty six war and sixty seven. Uh, you now have a situation in which an extremist, um, once ragtag militia, uh, driven by ideology, the Houthis, um, now run by uh, one of the founder sons, Abdul Malik Houthi, has turned this organization into a significant threat, a proto-state which controls uh, one Arab capital in Sana'a. The Houthis now control... Um, a part of the country which contains Yemen, which contains a third of the population of the entire nation. And rather than being sort of wholly owned subsidiaries uh, by Iran, they are willing participants driven by ideology, a common affinity. They're both 12 or Shia, just like the Iranians inspired by the Iranian revolution. They now, thanks to technology, uh, now drones are being manufactured uh, in by the Houthis. They now have presented themselves as an actor, uh, certainly now on the regional stage, and given Kirby's uh, comment, no, I need an actor as well. The relation, uh, Dr. Miller, the relationship of Saudi Arabia with some form of recent peace agreement with the Houthis, but I don't buy it for a minute, triangulate our interests with these rebels with Saudi Arabia and Riyadh. Well, the Saudis right now do not want uh, a major escalation. Uh, given the fact that uh, Mohammed bin Salman's plans for 2030 have now been, in some respect, um, uh, undermined by regional instability caused by the uh, Israel-Hamas war, Saudis are trying to find a way to extricate themselves from Yemen. Uh, they fought the Houthis unsuccessfully. They may have actually have energized the Houthi cause by any number of errant uh, airstrikes, which killed the um, hundreds, if not, if not thousands, of Yemenis. So I think the Saudis don't want uh, a U.S. escalation with the Houthis, and either do the Omanis, who are serving as a sort of bridge. Look, you, you look and see the maritime task force that uh, Secretary Austin tried to assemble. You've got seven, eight nations. The only regional nation that agreed to participate is Bahrain, and that's considered a sort of consolation prize, uh, given their relationship with Saudi Arabia. So uh, the Arab states seem very reluctant, as long as the Israeli Gaza war goes on, to join in in a, an American effort to suppress a group that is actually even more than Hezbollah launching an actual short-range ballistic missile in Israel's direction. This is a this is going to be a huge problem because our options here are not great. We can go through them if you want, but it, it, in terms of deterrence, we're already past that. But the Houthis don't seem to be able to be deterred right now. Aaron, what you just said there was fascinating, that the Middle Eastern allies traditionally with the United States are not getting involved because of the war between Israel and Hamas. Is this sort of Iran taking this opportunity to direct the Houthis to do this, to exploit the weakness, the lack of ties right now between Riyadh and Washington, D.C.? I think that, yeah, I mean, uh, some have argued that the one of the key motivators of the Hamas terror surge on October 7 uh, was a sort of pro-Iranian and pro-Hamas effort to uh, undermine uh, a, uh, a relationship, Israel-Saudi-U.S., that could have created a whole new security architecture in the region. We, I mean, we're prepared, apparently, don't get me started on this, to uh, basically conclude a mutual defense pact with Saudi Arabia in an effort to facilitate this normalization process. We haven't done that since we amended the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty in 1960. So, yeah, this was, I think, a, a part of Iran's calculation uh, to, to chill that, uh, um, that um, relationship that was emerging and ultimately uh, undermine it. And well, the Houthis have the same have the same motivation. Which to me really raises this question, okay, how much does this add to the urgency of getting some resolution to uh, the war between Israel and Hamas that seems to maybe be entering a new phase but doesn't seem close to a resolution? It's an important point. I, you know, it's now global trade, it's now supply chain, it's now Christmas. I mean, 10 to 15% of global trade through uh, the Red Sea and Suez Canal. 
three-week delay, and BP has already pulled their Red Sea uh, operational trade uh, from that region. You have to go around the Cape of Good Hope. That adds another three weeks to a month. I mean, this could, if it, if it truly began to uh, to uh, cause other private companies, basically, right. uh, to uh, to pull out of, of the Red Sea trade, have a, have a big impact. I just don't think it's going to affect either Israel's or Hamas's right. calculation. That's being driven by a whole new set, a whole different set of dynamics. And David Miller, if we decide to become more offensive against these, whatever they are, terrorists, these Houthis, whatever you want to call them, is that a decision of defense? Is that a decision of state in defense? State, is it decided at 1600 Pennsylvania? How do we change a thrust politically in Washington? <laughs> 1600 Pennsylvania. I mean, the options, I'm told, are already on the table. You could have armed escorts, but we don't have enough warships. You could create a corridor with a sort of a drone, anti-drone, anti-missile bubble above them. But remember, every time the Houthis launch a $2,000 <coughs> drone, we respond with interceptors that cost $2 million. And the Pentagon is already concerned about the expense of waging war, I think the only real deterrence would be strikes against Houthi assets in Yemen. Yeah. And yeah. quite the fact that they've launched 38 drones and any number of missiles, uh, we've just intercepted. I don't think there's a real drive on the part of the administration to go there, mm -hmm. although it... You have to leave it there. Aaron David Miller, thank you so much for the briefing with the Carnegie Endowment. Can't say enough about his writings over the recent uh, decades as, as well. Subscribe to the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live every weekday starting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, tune in, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can watch us live on Bloomberg Television and always on the Bloomberg Terminal. Thanks for listening. I'm Tom Keen, and this is Bloomberg.